Welcome to Science, Technology and the Future. This is your host, Adam. And today I'm interviewing well-known theoretical physicist and string theorist, Brian Greene. He's the author of a number of books, including The Elegant Universe, Icarus at the Edge of Time, The Fabric of the Cosmos, and Hidden Reality. And uh, at this point, I'd just like to say many thanks to Susie and Desh at Thinking for helping to organise this interview and for bringing Brian Green to Australia for a number of shows. So it's great to have you on the show, Brian Green. My pleasure. I'm wondering if you've been uh, watching the news lately about the artificial intelligence uh, that has been able to beat Lee Sedol. On um, yeah, at, 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 a, at the game go, it's been a, been a bit of a hot topic recently. Yeah, in fact, um, I happened to have dinner with the very people who were responsible for the programming, and they gave me advance word that their program had beat the Go champion, and it was uh, enormously exciting to hear. Yeah, well, this is uh, well, that's great that I'm asking this question. So, I mean, it seems as though uh, Deep Mind has defeated Lee Settle, who's the Grand Master at Go, in a tournament, the first three games, and has just recently um, just lost the fourth. Um, but uh, do you have any thoughts on the implications of artificial intelligence now and in the future? Well, I think there's no denying that as we go forward, artificial intelligence is going to be a powerful competitor to the human mind and will probably ultimately exceed its capacity. And some people find that terrifying. I find it thrilling because ultimately our goal is to understand the universe better, to be able to control the environment better. And if we have a different kind of intelligence that can grab hold of the very things that perhaps the human brain can't yet, then that's something that we should all find inspiring. Absolutely. It would be very interesting to have a conversation with, a, you know, a, an artificial intelligence that had a sort of a global understanding of physics. Well, it could be interesting, but it all depends on how well they are at programming the personality of this thing. But certainly there'd be insights to be gained. Yeah, that's interesting. So, yeah, you, you're concerned, um, as many others are, about uh, how to program an AI such that it would have a a congenial personality that's what somewhat friendly to humans is that what you're well it certainly would be more fun that way um but uh, you know the, the the bottom line is i think that these researchers need to have uh, our enormous respect and and gratitude that they're finding a way of mimicking human thought but using the power of technology to take it further and that's ultimately what research is about it's looking at key problems and finding creative solutions and having the perseverance to conquer. And that's what they did with Go. Yeah, that's amazing. And it is a bit of a historic moment in AI, for sure. Um, so yeah, very much so. The funny thing is, in the United States, hardly anyone's paying attention because Go is not a game that many people play, or at least relatively speaking. Hmm. But uh, it, it, it deserves the kind of attention that at least you're giving to it. Well, I heard um, reports from a couple of sources saying that 60% or so of uh, viewers were coming from China. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I can well imagine that. Yeah, yeah, well, the game was uh, created in China. I'm just wondering, yep. you know, whether the government or, or organizations in China are going to um, listen to this more and perhaps do something about artificial intelligence in the future. Yeah. Yeah, well, woman hope. Mm-hmm. So um, now... Look, you've been uh, involved in uh, physics for quite some time, and uh, you, you've you been doing a lot uh, in string theory, so I'm just wondering if you could give us, I'm a non-physicist myself, and I, um, uh, a number of our view, uh, listeners and viewers aren't too, so can you give us a brief uh, a briefing on string theory and why you support this theory? Yeah, I can certainly do that. Uh, so string theory is an attempt to have a unified theory goal that Einstein chased relentlessly for 30 years. He devoted the last 30 years of his life to coming up with one explanation that might work for everything. It's a sort of a beautiful, compelling notion that the world might be governed by a single equation, but he couldn't find it. On his deathbed, he was doing calculations, still trying to get the unified theory, but he didn't find it. And string theory is a proposal that might be the unified theory that Einstein was searching for. Right, yes, and it, it's certainly exciting to think about, like, a unifying theory. Um, now, look, there's, there seems to be uh, a, quite a territory of opinion out there, among, like a big map of 
opinions out there of people who have spent time and effort in thinking carefully about revel, uh, relevant questions in physics. Now, there, there seems to be a, a bit of a disagreement and conjecture uh, about what the nature of reality is or what this unifying theories might be. There's been uh, polls around the place. Now, why do you think there are such differences in opinion about this? Well, we're talking about questions for which we don't yet have observational or experimental insight. So, in the end of the day, different researchers follow their equations, they follow their mathematics, and they have to make judgments based on their own intuition, which comes from their own experience and their own prejudice. So some will warm to the idea that we are one of many universes, an idea that directly comes out of the math of cosmology and string theory. Others find that idea utterly abhorrent, think that it's no longer science if you're talking about realms beyond our universe, and they strictly want to adhere to the older notion that there's one universe and it's our goal to explain it. And at the moment, we just don't know who's right and who's wrong. But that's fine. Those are the fertile moments in science when there is a great deal of controversy, a great deal of energetic conversation, a lot of confusion, and ultimately it will resolve, and we will have some deeper understanding of how the world works. So this isn't something that somehow should be viewed as a black mark against science or about some black mark against string theory. This is the bread and butter of trying to figure things out. Absolutely. Well, what are some well, major fundamental points of contention here, and how do you think these might be resolved to approach a, a, a grand unifying theory in the future? Well, I mean, the fundamental point of contention, the only one worthy of any attention, is that we are exploring a realm that's beyond the reach currently of the Large Hadron Collider, beyond the reach of the Hubble Space Telescope, maybe beyond the reach of the James Webb Telescope that's coming up, So we're in a realm where only equations are the light that's illuminating our pathway. And since we don't have a unique set of equations, we don't have a unique direction to pursue. And some will say, therefore, that you're not doing science, that you need to wait until the observations or the experiments can test these domains. And I tell them, well, that's kind of silly. The human mind is this powerful creative engine, and we need to allow it to explore those things that it finds interesting. And if a given researcher doesn't want to work on string theory, goodness gracious, don't work on it. Work on something else. Mm -hmm. But to have a sentiment that those who do pursue science that's beyond the reach of today's observations, that somehow they step beyond the bounds of what's worthy of attention, is just plain silly. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, what, a lot of people actually uh, disagree with finances, money being spent, resources being spent on working out, working on fundamental physics. Yeah. But, right. Um, now, now uh, one, one could argue, but there's, although we don't know what the engineering applications may be in the future, there have been engineering applications that have come about through an understanding of physics. But what, 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 what do you say to people who... I uh, say that we shouldn't be spending money or resources on understanding fundamental things. Well, I, I tell, what I tell them, I tell them to wake up. Wake up and recognize that fundamental science has radically changed the way they live their lives today. If any of these individuals have a cell phone or a personal computer, or perhaps they themselves or a loved one has been saved by an MRI machine, I mean, any of these devices rely upon integrated circuits, which themselves rely upon quantum physics. So if those folks were in charge in the 1920s and said, hey, you guys work in quantum physics, you know, that doesn't seem to be relevant to anything in the world around us, so we're going to cut your funding, well, those people would have short-circuited one of the greatest revolutions that our species has gone through, the information age, the technological age. So the bottom line is you need to support fundamental research because we know historically that when you gain a deep understanding of how things work, you can often leverage that to then manipulate the world around you in spectacular ways. And that needs to be where the fundamental funding goes, and that needs to be where a fundamental focus remains in science. Absolutely. Now, I'd like like to move on to uh, alien life and possible civilizations. And uh, I've uh, sort of seen a few of your interviews before, but what do you... 
Do you believe that there are that there do exist advanced alien civilizations somewhere within this universe? Well, anybody on planet Earth that professes an absolute, you know, certainty about the existence of life beyond Earth doesn't know what they're talking about. You will only know that when you see it. If there's no evidence yet, all you're doing is conjecturing. So, at the level of conjecture, yeah, sure. Gut level, it seems to me likely that there is life out there. There are ever more planets that we are discovering. It now seems likely that just about every star has a planetary system. You got a uh, 300 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. You got a hundred billion galaxies in the observable universe. Perhaps 20 percent of those might the Earth-like planets around those stars and those galaxies. So there are just so many planets that it seems, just by the numbers, reasonable to guess that there's life and perhaps intelligent life. But the bottom line is we know so little about how life forms, we know so little about how intelligent life emerges once life forms, that maybe we're fooling ourselves. Maybe the conditions that are necessary for that collection of ideas to hold true, namely that you get life and then intelligent life, maybe it's such a tremendous high bar of conditions required that it happens incredibly rarely, maybe even once. I mean, think about it. If that asteroid that slammed into the Earth 65 million years ago hadn't hit us, it might be that the dinosaurs are still walking around. Life, but unlikely the dinosaurs would be fashioning radio telescopes and broadcasting out to the universe. So we just don't know. But yeah, at a gut level, I would agree with those who say that there probably is alien life, but that's totally just conjecture. Yeah. I guess further along the lines of conjecture, I think this intertwines with the original question about like uh, AI and technological development. Do you think alien civilizations, or perhaps even our own civilization, would be relying heavily upon um, advanced technology? Would this... Based on our trajectory and how we're moving now, would you expect alien life to um, would to have gone through a similar technological trajectory to become an advanced civilization like a spacefaring civilization? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, the only answer to your question is, of course, yes. But it's because of the way we're framing the question and yeah. the insight that we're using to guide our answer, which is one single data point: mm. how things happened here on planet Earth. So certainly, based on that one data point, yeah, we'd be led to exactly the conclusion that you're drawing. But one data point is not a lot to go on. And it could be that what happens out there is very different from what has happened here. Yeah. Yeah, which would make it very hard to find, uh, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, in that case, well, what, and more speculatively, what do you think the future of uh, our civilization might look like if we reach the stars? Well... I think we probably will be heading in that direction. I mean, we typically are a species that wants to spread its wings and fly. So yes, I can imagine that in some number of centuries or millennia, we may be sending out the kinds of vehicles that would allow us to populate other worlds, perhaps even reaching other star systems. Yes, I think that is a, a real possibility going forward. Mm-hmm. Certainly very fascinating uh, future we're living in now. We're living in a fascinating yes. today. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, I'm very interested to see, see uh, how our civilization turns out, especially if in the next 40 to 100 yeah, yeah, years. That, all, that, that does assume we survive, but I like yes. to be optimistic on that point too. Yes, absolutely. So in, in, uh, in final, the final question is, what's the most amazing thing about science, physics, life, the universe that you find at the moment? What's exciting you the most? Well, I'd say the most exciting thing is the recent discovery of gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's exciting is not only because it confirms another prediction of Albert Einstein. You can get tired of that after a while. The guy just seemed to have a monopoly on the great <laughs> ideas. But it really opens up a whole new way of exploring the cosmos. Mm -hmm. Right, And we have learned that every time we gain a new tool for exploring the universe, be it Galileo and his telescope, be it then the developments which allow us to examine the universe in radio waves, radio telescopes, or infrared, or ultraviolet, or x-ray, each new tool to examine the cosmos opens up a whole different cosmic landscape. Mm -hmm. Now we have a 
brand new tools, not even using waves of light, but using waves of gravity. Mm. And I think many of us are just on the edge of our seat waiting to see how the universe really looks when you examine it using waves of gravity. And that's what's going to happen in the next 5, 10, 20, 50 years. So the new era of astronomy, in which gravitational waves are our probe, has now just opened up. So it's the most exciting thing to imagine what we will learn in the next 50 years. Absolutely. Well, Brian, uh, it's been fantastic having you on the show, and big thank you to Think Inc. as well. And to all the listeners, uh, look at the website and check out some of the shows that uh, Brian Green is uh, going to be giving talks at in the next couple of weeks. So I'm looking forward to seeing you in Melbourne, Brian. Very good. Looking forward to that. Thank you. Thanks heaps. Sure. Bye. Bye.